Good morning. Good morning and welcome Duke alumni and friends. I am Sterley Wilder, a proud member of the class of 1983 and the Associate Vice President for Alumni Affairs. We really appreciate you making the time to join us for what we know will be an incredible program. Today's event is one of the many offerings from our new Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute, an interdisciplinary educational program exclusively for you. The Forever Learning Institute showcases Duke's faculty and alumni expertise in four thematically organized courses with combinations of lectures, panel discussions, online courses, and workshops offered virtually. In addition to the live options, you may also find more opportunities for learning with the robust syllabus course generated by recommendations from faculty and administrative leaders, including programs offered by our campus partners, curated playlists on our lifelong learning YouTube channel, Duke produced podcasts and articles written by members of the Duke community. Today's program is part of the course, Advancing Health and Wellness. And this theme focuses on advancements in health and the progress we are making to ensure we increase both the length of our lives and the quality of those years. Moderating for us today is Carmichael Roberts, class of 90 and Duke PhD 05, and is the parent of Alex, class of 24. Carmichael is the founder and managing partner of Material Impact, a fund that builds valuable companies that solve real world problems using innovative materials technology. A longtime Duke volunteer and supporter, Carmichael previously served on the board of directors for the Duke Alumni Association from 2007 to 13 and on its executive committee starting in 2008. In 2013, he was elected to the Board of Trustees at Duke, and in 2017, he was appointed to the Duke University Health System Board of Directors. It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to my friend, R. Michael Roberts. Thanks so much, Sterling. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me say, grab your coffee and your morning tea. We're in for a treat today with our two speakers, Dr. Bart Haynes and Dr. Matthew Hepburn, both esteemed Dukies at the top of their games respectively are front and center as it relates to helping our country get vaccinated uh, during this pandemic. Now, for those of you who remember the Duke event just a few um, months ago, last fall, Bart was actually our keynote speaker then where he talked about vaccine development with hopes of getting something approved by late 2020 last year or early this year. Meanwhile, Matt, who was not part of that event was working away dutifully on strategies, not only to develop a vaccine, but also deployment anticipation and anticipation of approval of one or more vaccines. So here we sit today, early 2021, with a number of vaccines approved and more approval of new vaccines likely on the way. But as we all know, things have been anything but smooth and seamless these past 10 weeks or so since we had the approval of the very first vaccine. There's fear among many about safety of the vaccines themselves. There's concern among and many about the effectiveness of the vaccines against COVID variants. Um, there's most uh, apparently frustration in the deployment of the vaccines, everyone feeling not fast enough. But hey, let's all admit something. This is really hard stuff. We're in uncharted territory. And I have to say, even with the stress that comes on these topics, we're very fortunate and hopefully very grateful with the progress that's been made to date. Let me speak personally. I can certainly say that I am very grateful having seen many of my loved ones get vaccinated over the last uh, several weeks, including my 80 year old mother who happens to live in Durham. Um, I can proudly say that these two gentlemen served us well as Dukies. And um, for this, Bart and Matt, we thank you all, all of us from the bottom of our hearts. So let's go a little bit deeper. Who is Bart Haynes? So Dr. Bart Haynes is a world-class scientist with a distinguished career in immunology. His awards and recognitions are honestly too many to name in total, several for lifetime achievements in infectious disease work, simply stellar. Bart is a member of the National Academy of Sciences for Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and of course, he's a fellow of, infectious, of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Bart has had numerous leadership positions at Duke, including previously serving as chair of the Department of Medicine. Way back in 1990, 
Bart founded the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, where today he sits as its director. Visionary and very timely. As for training and education, Bart did both his internship and residency uh, at, Duke, at the Duke University Medical Center. So who is Matt Hepburn? Dr. Matthew Hepburn is also Colonel Matthew Hepburn from the US Army. Matt, let me pause now for a second just to thank you for your many years of service. Now to give everyone a better sense of Matt's service, let me share some of his previous assignments, just a few. He was chief medical officer at a level two medical facility in Iraq. He was clinical research director of, at the US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases. He was an exchange officer in the United Kingdom. And in terms of teaching, he was internal medicine chief of residence at Brook Army Medical Center at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Uh, today, <clears throat> most recently, uh, Colonel Matt Hepburn is also assigned to DARPA, right? That's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, where he was a program manager and served since 2013. He made a slight shift in 2020 for good reasons. But let me just say, for those of you who don't, who've not heard of DARPA before, in summary, it's an elite group of innovators who come up with technologies for the military that saves lives. These technologies almost always find their way in society at large to make the world a better place. I say this because no doubt this prepared Matt to have a significant role in Operation Warp Speed to fight this pandemic on behalf of our country. Matt's a double dookie. Proud double dookie with a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and a medical degree from the Duke University Medical Center. So let's get down to the most interesting thing, hearing the two of them talk. Um, let me first describe the format. Bart will speak first, Matt will speak right after. Please listen carefully and enjoy, but uh, as Sterling mentioned earlier, feel free to submit questions along the way. I'll gather those questions and at the very end of both presentations from Matt and Bart, uh, they'll try to answer as many questions as possible, recognizing the practical limitations that come from time constraints. So without further ado, let's get this thing started with you, Bart, uh, handing over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Carmichael, for that kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here talking with you today. We're gonna to talk just a little bit about developing tests in COVID-19 and pan-coronavirus vaccines in just the next few moments. And so uh, we worked to develop tests early on in the uh, epidemic back last February. We started, we knew how important testing was gonna to be to bring students back to school and to allow research and healthcare to continue at Duke and to benefit the surrounding community. Secondly, um, I'll briefly mention the most recent work on uh, development of pan-coronavirus vaccine in case escape mutants arise or new coronaviruses emerge for a new outbreak. And the goal with any of the coronaviruses vaccines is to induce what's called neutralizing antibodies. And I have a picture up here of a, a one virus particle and these red spikes on the surface are the spike proteins. They're the molecules to which our body makes neutralizing uh, antibodies. And it's the neutralizing antibodies that prevent the virus from infecting our cells. And so again, back last March, we started in on this. We knew that there were a number of companies making the first generation of vaccines. And so we thought the best way to help with both to deal with safety, which we can talk about in the questions, um, and also to uh, design the next generation vaccines, not only because we knew that this virus was an RNA virus, and therefore it was prone to uh, mutate. And then secondly, um, to develop uh, vaccines in case the first generation vaccines needed boosting. All right, well, let's talk about test development. And uh, this is uh, to introduce you to our chief administrative officer, the chief operating officer in the Vaccine Institute, Thomas Denny. Tom Denny has headed this. He's the world's expert on tests. He is a pioneer in HIV testing and uh, 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 therapeutics development. And <clears throat> Early on, very early on, February, March, his team developed a SARS-CoV-2 genetic test called polymerase chain reaction test that could be applied uh, very quickly and cheaply across the uh, university to screen all of our students and faculty and staff um, and then confirm any infections that we found with uh, an approved test. 
perform it, uh, since uh, last August. The team at DHVI has been performing tests for Duke to keep Duke safe and the students and faculty safe. And in this manner, we've really controlled the level of infection spread on campus to a remarkable degree. Right now, DHVI performs about 5,000 tests per week for the students and the community. And as an example of the scale of this, 175,000 tests were run just the first semester alone and over 150,000 have been run in well into the second semester. <clears throat> On the right hand side here, you see, <coughs> excuse me, you see what uh, the Vaccine Institute has been turned into. These are all uh, lovely meeting spaces, no more. Uh, they're filled with robots over here, um, uh, uh, PCR machines to do genetic tests. And we receive samples from all over the campus um, for testing where the uh, centralized uh, re receiving point. Now let's talk about uh, vaccines very briefly and we'll have an extended discussion about vaccines, I hope. Um, but I need to talk to you about this concept that Carmichael meant, uh, meant, mentioned of mutant viruses, escape viruses. And right now there are tracking systems in place and there are over 4,000 different escape or not uh, variants of the virus. Uh, some of them escape, some of them not. And, um, but the two that are concerning everyone that you're hearing about on the news is the United Kingdom mutant. Uh, and this a mutant of SARS-CoV-2 uh, has increased transmission and may have a suggestion of increased severity of the disease. Our, that is the body is less able to get rid of this virus than um, the original virus, decreased sensitivity to certain neutralizing antibodies, and it's rapidly spreading in the US. And some of the uh, epidemiologists and, and uh, groups following the, uh, the virus mutants are, are projecting that it's this virus, this UK mutant, which uh, will, may win out and be the most common virus in the United States by June, July. A second mutant is the South African mutant. <clears throat> it also has increased transmission, greater resistance to neutralizing antibodies. It's just been found in the US. It's on both the East and the West Coast now. Um, and in September, it was first seen in September in South Africa. And by the middle of November, it had become 90% of the viruses in South Africa. It is a, a bit more of concern because it has greater resistance to neutralizing antibodies induced by the current vaccines than the United Kingdom variant. The good news here is that by all of the studies that have just come out, the United Kingdom variant is going to be um, only minimally decreased in sensitivity to the current vaccines. And we're less worried about this variant. The South African mutant uh, uh, does appear to have uh, more of a uh, take, uh, uh, our, uh, the current vaccines to take more of a hit with regard to their uh, neutralization potency for this mutant. So what's the way forward to the future? Well, <clears throat> to backtrack a little bit, as I said, the virus is mutating and it has now jumped to man now three times from animals such as bats. When I say the virus has jumped to man, the viruses within the overall category of coronaviruses has jumped to man. Once in 2003, and it caused a disease called SARS. In 2011, it caused a disease called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And then in 2019, causing COVID-19. All different viruses, but related. They're all coronaviruses. And then we have these escape mutants. So that um, the, the, a, a jump of another coronavirus is gonna happen again. Francis Collins uh, wrote a few days ago that we need to start now preparing for COVID-24. Uh, so the question is what to do. And so we believe that the key is to develop a pan-coronavirus vaccine that can prevent infection from new animal viruses that might jump to humans and, and can also respond to escape mutant viruses. And so the key to this is that we started back last March by identifying sites on this red spike protein up here uh, that are common to groups of coronavirus and putting those common regions into a vaccine. And so <clears throat> what we found in our antibody studies is there's a spot on the coronavirus spike that antibodies can bind to and neutralize both COVID-2, the COVID-19 virus can bind to its escape mutants and to many other animal coronaviruses. And so I want to introduce you to Dr. Kevin Saunders, who's our director of research in the Duke Human Vaccine Institute. And Dr. Saunders is an accomplished molecular biologist and has designed this um, uh, artificial 
uh, molecule in which he's put on 24 pieces, little pieces of the spike protein to which these cross-reactive neutralizing antibodies bind. And so we've taken this artificial pan coronavirus vaccine particle with 24 pieces of the spike protein. We put them into monkeys. The monkeys have induced antibodies and the antibodies uh, have been found to neutralize not only SARS-CoV-2 there with the red spikes, but also the original SARS virus, CoV-1, that occurred in 2003, and to a number of bat coronaviruses that we uh, know have potential to jump to man in the future. So, but what about the SARS-CoV-2 escape mutants in the UK, South Africa, and now the UK variant that's now in the US that we anticipate will be the most common virus. And so this vaccine induces antibodies that bind or neutralize escape viruses. And frankly, uh, the antibodies in the monkeys neutralize the UK virus just as well as it does the original mutant virus. So we're excited about that. So we wanted to know if, if this vaccine actually protected primates from challenge with a pathogenic uh, uh, coronavirus. And so we challenged the monkeys with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the monkeys were all completely protected from infection. And so our next step is to, is to challenge both vaccinated mice and monkeys with the South African variant. And we're working with our colleagues, John Mescola and, and, and others at the NIH Vaccine Research Center to um, uh, develop this challenge var variant and to challenge uh, newly vaccinated animals. So finally, um, how, how were we able to do all this? And that was because of Duke's in early investment and we were ready uh, for pandemic, uh, for the next pandemic. We, uh, as Carmichael said, we had the Duke Human Vaccine Institute with 260 members of world-class investigators and staff who are, are skilled at working with a wide variety of pathogens. Back in 2006, the NIH built a regional bio, what's called a regional biocontainment laboratory at Duke, this low building here just behind the Vaccine Institute, which is right on to the right. Um, and this is a, a what's called a biosafety level three um, uh, building where we can safely do all of the work that's necessary. So when the coronavirus vaccine, um, epidemic hit, we immediately the next day, we were in the laboratory acquiring the sequences and starting the work to be able to grow the virus. In addition, we have built six years ago, a vaccine manufacturing facility in this building, um, uh, the Vaccine uh, Institute building. And we have five suites there where we can do everything from making a vaccine to putting it into the bottles. And then we have a clinical trial unit that can do the clinical trial. So we can move very quickly. So um, in summary, we've had 15 years of research of basic and translational science, uh, in particular on HIV. Uh, and it's, it's the HIV technology that was just pivoted and used to make this pan coronavirus vaccine. This is how we're making the HIV vaccine. As I said, we have an NIH funded clinical trials unit. We have quality uh, units run by Tom Denny. So um, we uh, can uh, make sure that our research is top notch. And then finally, I wanna just mention the program, um, uh, Carmichael mentioned that Matt Hetburn had worked for DARPA. And DARPA, now about uh, three and a half years ago, uh, led by Matt Hepburn, who's our next speaker, came up with this program called the P3, Pandemic Prevention uh, Preparedness Program for prevention of the next pandemic to get the United States ready to respond quickly to whatever hit next. And so Duke was one of four winners of, uh, uh, and uh, funded by DARPA in that uh, competition. And so for the past three years, we've been developing technology to even quicker than we had been able to do before to isolate antibodies and to find these spots um, on the virus, et cetera. And so it was the combination of this technology um, and the speed here, this was a mini warp speed, sort of a warm up to what Dr. Hepburn is doing now um, that really has allowed uh, the United States to respond in an incredibly quick manner. Outstanding, Bart. Um, Matt, I don't want to suck up any time. I think people want to hear from you. Over to you Super. now. Good Talk. morning. And, and yes, my good friend Bart going before, thanks for uh, those comments. And I will say in terms of the, the DARPA program, just to give people a little bit more perspective, um, what, what Duke in that, vaccine re in that vaccine institute has is extraordinarily unique for an academic institution because what they have is the world-class basic research, 
but it's coupled with the initial manufacturing and ability to do clinical trials. Having all those things under one roof is really special. Um, uh, Bart made the point, it takes years to build that, and now it's built, now it's doing amazing work. And, uh, and they, they were selected among uh, many great candidates. Um, it does, with DARPA though, there's a bit of a enter at your own risk kind of too, because the expectations were uh, that they were gonna be able to go faster than they ever could before, and to be able to do that in the first year of the funding. So um, we were uh, uh, very uh, unrealistic and put tons of pressure, and, and that Duke team you know, was, has really been working around the clock for the last few years to be ready. Um, so, so what I wanted to do, I want to talk a little bit about where we were. I want a, a tiny bit about where we are right now, and then um, just a few quick comments on the future. Um, one of the questions uh, that I get most is, is sort of with Operation Warp Speed, and, and again, my title was the Vaccine Development Lead for Operation Warp Speed. Um, the uh, what, what what went well? Like, how were we actually able to 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 be successful to get to the point where now we have over uh, 65 million doses administered in the United States. Um, I think it starts with uh, with what you heard from Bart. Is that you know we were we were able to drive a process to have vaccine available within a year uh, because we had 15 years or 30 years head start. The the investment and the investment in basic research, the uh, the uh, all of the learning. Um, that went into how to make vaccines, understanding the immune response, um, the work that BART did, for example, on HIV vaccines, all of that produced sort of a, a background knowledge and background technology that was, that was ready to go last January. And I think many people uh, before the pandemic was, were sort of like, well, what's RNA? And now it's, uh, you know, with the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine product, like we, we talk, you know, you, you watch any of the news channels and they're talking about RNA and RNA vaccines on a daily basis. Um, that, the reason we were able to develop RNA vaccines so quickly is because of really 15 years of basic research um, to be able to uh, make that technology available for the pandemic. So, so I think, it makes two points. The first is why do we fund basic research? Why do we nurture universities and academic environments? Is so that they can deliver and deliver quickly with, again, just profound scientific accomplishment. The second is, is that, you know, we make the point, I know this is an alumni group, but we make the point, um, especially for uh, people, you know, for students that are getting their PhDs and people that are interested in biotechnology and biomedical research, it's like, look what you can do. I, I mean, I think there is a profoundly inspirational story um, for why, why pursue a career in research, why pursue a career in the health sciences um, that, that marries all of these technologies and things like that is because look, you can, you can really change the world. And so um, the first reason that we have vaccines now is because the United States really nurtured that environment and because of all the vaccine work uh, done before us. The second is that Carmichael, I really appreciate your, you know, the, the thank you. And, you know, I, frankly, I've gotten hundreds of those um, where people have said, hey, we, I got vaccinated, I'm a healthcare worker. And frankly, it's very emotional for me. Um, it's moving to kind of hear. Um, the, the problem is it's really not me. I mean, what it's, uh, I think it's really an accomplishment uh, of the United States. And I would say it's sort of the, the best that America has to offer. Um, I remind people that we had over 100,000 people, uh, su Americans, su volunteers sign up for our different clinical trials uh, for, for the different products that we accelerate. I mean, just think about that alone. Um, those people, you know, you're getting the vaccine or you may be getting a placebo. It's, it was an individual choice that thousands of Americans made. And I think the number one pe reason people signed up for clinical trials is they wanted to help in terms of pandemic response. Um, there are literally thousands of people in with the different companies for which we partner with right now that are working on product development, working on manufacturing, ensuring that all the vaccine goes into the vials and it gets shipped. And there are literally thousands of public health experts and pharmacists right now in America, you know, vaccinating Americans. 
So, you know, the the reason we are successful is that, you know, the pandemic has been so painful for our nation. Um, I hope, though, that we can kind of tell a story of this is where we came together as a nation. We work together as a nation um, and we achieved something really fantastic. So it, it was that ethic and is the reason that we're vaccinating people now. Um, one of the th couple other things about our process, because um, Carmichael, you alluded to um, a lot of questions about is the vaccine safe? And, you know, how did, how, if you developed sort of the, 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 the premise um, that, that I've been asked since last May is, is that, well, how can you develop a vaccine so fast, but not cut corners? And, uh, you know, when we started, I think we were, we were public and we were definitive that there, we are not cutting corners, that you can do both. And uh, we could, I can send, circulate an article on a lot of the different things we did in terms of resources and manufacturing at scale, taking um, essentially risks in terms of making more doses earlier in the process than you normally would. But we never were compromising on safety and we were never compromising on efficacy. We insisted throughout the process that the highest standards of vaccine product development would be met. And those standards, you know, go to the Food and Drug Administration, where we, you know, in, in my opinion, and maybe of many others, really sets the world standard in terms of the quality of product. And so we said throughout the process that we would meet the highest standards of proving that a vaccine works in clinical trials and making sure that that vaccine was safe. Um, I want to illustrate uh, an example of that, that I, I, and I think I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but I think this is very unique for the world. Um, tomorrow, the, the FDA advisory committee is meeting um, to evaluate the Janssen, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That is a public hearing. That is, uh, uh, and they, they do these all the time for products. Uh, normally, not many people show up. I think for the, for the Moderna one, I think they had over 10,000 people uh, you know, on the on the WebEx and listening along in real time. I mean, and, and the company essentially shows shows everything. Everything, you know, here, here's all of the evidence that we're providing to earn an emergency use authorization. I mean, that, that's pretty extraordinary. Think about, I don't think anywhere else in the world has that type of, if you will, uh, a public display of all the information about the vaccine uh, before the vaccine is approved. I, I think that transparency, at least what I hope is inspires confidence um, that people say, okay. And, and that's the one question when people say, you know, Matt, you know, is this, is this vaccine safe? And I say, in my professional opinion, it is, but look for yourself and ask your healthcare providers because they can look, the, these data are out there public and that transparency hopefully inspires confidence. Um, the other thing we did with the clinical trials um, that that um, did get some press early in the process, but um, it, it doesn't get publicized as much now, is, is that we, we really um, insisted um, that the enrollment in the clinical trials uh, reflected the diversity of our population. And I think some of you um, health experts would realize that, you know, many, many clinical trials in the past have sort of skewed to certain populations. Um, because those populations may be easier to enroll or for, for lots of different um, complex reasons. But what we said is we, we insisted that the, the clinical trials represented the U.S. populations in terms of gender and racial diversity, um, also in terms of making sure that elderly uh, volunteers were recruited uh, to show that we, these vaccines protect some of our most vulnerable populations. Um, and I think really all of the clinical trials that we partnered with and sponsored um, reflected that diversity. Um, and that's, again, how they all should be. And hopefully we, we learn from that and we set standards that will, be, that will perpetuate going forward. Um, my last comment is that I think for most of you know that the Operation Warp Speed was this really nice hybrid between the Department of Defense, which is where I come from, and the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of concern when we started to say, well, the Department of Defense is taking over public health. And um, what turned out is that it was, it was a really nice model um, 
that I'd frankly never seen before in my uh, 20, 25 years of, of, uh, of army and government service. Um, by bringing together, if you will, the best of different aspects of our government. And what I think the Department of Defense does really well is operations and logistics planning. And um, I, I don't know if people know this well, but that the, the planning for the distribution of the vaccine started in May. And we had uh, literally hundreds of Department of Defense experts who typically worry about moving military equipment all over the world and making sure that it works and plan every single detail and contingency plan of operations. Um, and they put that effort into uh, the, the distribution, um, but also all of the logistics and supply chain for vaccine manufacturing. That was another way that we could go so fast is we were able to sort out the supply chain so that our vaccine manufacturers got what they needed immediately. Um, I think that's a, it's a profound, it's a profoundly, there's a lot we can learn from a public policy standpoint going forward in terms of leveraging all of the different aspects of the best of government uh, to immediately solve a problem. I think we're, a, we're a, great, a great case study where that happened. So where we are now, um, I think Bart alluded to this really nicely. Um, we're, uh, I think everybody would agree the, the sooner that we have Americans vaccinated, the better. Um, and that's, that's our very near term 24 hour, 24 seven um, goal um, to sort of complete that mission. Um, but we do have an eye now to say, um, are you gonna need a booster shot uh, with your COVID vaccine? That's, a, that's one issue we're trying to think through now and really understand the immunology as Bart alluded to and, and presented to you, that, that immunology is as a very practical, okay, do I need another shot or not? And when would I need a question, um, which we're looking into now. Um, the second is this idea of the variants. As again, Bart alluded to, um, do our, are our current vaccines gonna work or do we need new ones? And I think you've seen some press about this that um, Moderna yesterday um, did a press release where they said, you know, we're, we're already taking the first three or four steps that in case we need a vaccine against the variants, um, we're gonna be ready to go. Um, it really makes the point that Bart was saying before about this idea of preparing for future pandemics. Um, we're, we're now demonstrating time and again that we can make vaccines faster. And what I hope we see is that Every time we try to make a new vaccine, uh, we do it even faster. We set a, no a new normal, um, and then we try to beat it. And the last comment is that, you know, uh, a global pandemic requires a global response. Um, you've heard my comments focused primarily on Operation Warp Speed, which the, the mission was very well defined, which was having vaccines available to protect the American people. Um, but the work that we're doing now in terms of showing that these vaccines are safe and effective, figuring out how to manufacture those at scale, really create the opportunity for us to partner um, to ultimately vaccinate the world. And the, the, the solution to a pandemic can't be just vaccinate one country. You know, the obvious answer is, is that, um, is that it, this does require a global solution. Um, and frankly, I'm, I'm very excited about the, um, that opportunity to work on a global solution. I think uh, the United States really has a lot to offer to the global community. And through those types of partnerships, um, there are a lot of examples in global health where the United States has contributed very significantly in the past. Um, and what I, what I hope we see in 2021 and beyond is, is that we can use this pandemic as really a, a model uh, for, for international cooperation. Um, my, my final point, uh, and, and, I, and then we'll, we'll go over to, to questions, is that um, the, the question now I'm getting is, well, do, do vaccines really work? So you showed these clinical trials and we have these great results. Um, we're, we're actually very excited. I think people are tracking that the number of cases in the United States are, are dropping. Uh, which is great. Um, the, what we have looked at though is, is that um, the decision was made at the highest levels of government very early in the process 
um, to say that we wanted to make sure we vaccinated the long-term care facilities and, and, and those, those people in nursing homes um, who were extremely vulnerable uh, to this infection. And uh, who I, you know, again, I feel like we, we should, as, as, as Americans, we should protect those that are most vulnerable. So, so that decision made early on was to really make sure long-term care facilities and their, the, the workers um, were vaccinated. Um, Kaiser Family Foundation re yesterday published um, some numbers which show really a dramatic drop um, in the number of cases of infection in long-term care facilities, as well as um, much many less deaths um, in those facilities. Um, I find that very encouraging. And, it doesn't mean we're out of the woods, um, but it really does mean that um, you know we can we can take care of our people, and again, hopefully, then uh, really contribute uh, to the global response to this pandemic. Outstanding, both of you, um, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Matt. Matt, for that, I mean, I, I have my own questions that I'd love to monopolize and ask both of the two of you, but I, but I won't do that. I was looking um, at some of the questions that are coming in um, and some of the, let me ask just a general question uh, to, to either one of you can handle this. Uh, just some of the common sense questions that people have that's not so common in the answers. When we hear 90% effective versus playing the win, Matt, you said, you know, tomorrow J and J's, um, you know, day will be, uh, you know, there in, in terms of review. Let's play to win and say that goes well, hopefully. Um, what, is that, what does it mean to be 90% effective versus 70% effective? How do we think about that when you have two vaccines potentially in the market and people hear that? Well, I'll give my answer, then I'll turn it over to Matt because uh, it's a great question. Um, so, the Jan so a case study, the J&J &J vaccine was tested in South Africa and it was 85% of, and, and the UK, it was 85% effective in the UK, 60% effective in South Africa, reflecting the decrease in sensitivity to um, the, the uh, South African variant. But the, the early data suggests that it was 85% effective in preventing severe disease and hospitalizations and death. And so the hope is that when we get into some larger studies and get more data, that these vaccines that are um, less effective either against some of the variants or less effective against the original virus are going to still be effective in doing what we really want, and that's preventing severe disease and death. Matt? Um, so Carmichael, great question. Uh, I could talk the rest of the time about this. I, I do wanna raise kind of back to one of my points on where researching universities can be so helpful. Um, that there is, there is a whole bunch of work that needs to be done on health education, health communication and messaging um, because it's, it's so difficult to do. And um, I think one of the things that was unavoidable here is, is that you know, people really fixate on some specific numbers. And it's, it, you know, it's just hard to explain otherwise when people say, well, I want the 90%, I, I want the great version, I don't want the, I don't want the, the less impactful version. Um, we're, we're gonna struggle with this in, in the United States. We're gonna struggle with this in the global community too, as we, as we roll out vaccines globally. Um, I think Bart alluded probably to the most important key message is to really go back in terms of what we're, what is, it, at least in my opinion, what is the most important thing that we're trying to accomplish? What we're trying to accomplish is to prevent people from ending up in the hospital, overwhelming our healthcare system so that our healthcare system can't provide routine care and from preventing people from dying. And the consistent finding, which you know, we're very pleased about, is that with the J&J &J vaccine, with the Moderna vaccine, with the Pfizer vaccine, all of those vaccines are achieving that effect. And so, I think as we talk about the Janssen vaccine and we say, so it may, it may not do as well in terms of preventing you from getting infection and from maybe having some symptoms. Um, those symptoms are likely gonna be milder and, uh, it, and the chance of you ending up in the hospital 
you know, is a significant one, especially if you're at risk, and that goes to just about zero. Um, so, so we will continue to message that. I think you'll see our government um, trying to try, the messaging that I've seen on this has been pretty consistent so far, both from government and academic experts and everybody else. Um, the other point though, with the Janssen vaccine that comes up all the time is that, uh, is that it's a single dose vaccine um, that's much easier to store and transport, just much, much easier. And uh, you know, if there is a lesson in terms of vaccine distribution and administration, it's that you know, simple is beautiful. And so uh, you can, uh, and, and what our government is, is trying to think through right now is what's the best use of a single dose vaccine. But where the opportunity can be is it can be for rural communities where it's really hard, where you really have to go to the people to administer. It can be useful in settings where you just wanna you know, run a mass vaccination clinic for a day and you're not gonna have to worry about if people are coming back for the second dose or when or anything else, or, well, we gotta put it in the dry ice freezer for three days or you know, just open up the stadium and do 24 hours, first come, first serve and get a lot of people vaccinated. There's a lot of scenarios where this will be a great tool in the toolbox. And that is, uh, you know, why we're very excited about it. Thank you. And, and I, I would say firsthand, I would say as a, um, just as a citizen, if I'm told that any one of the three vaccines have a greater than 90 something percent chance or 95 percent chance of keeping me out of the hospital or dying and my mother, that's a heck of a message that should be given as compared to what's not what's currently given, which confuses people. I couldn't agree more. So thank you to both of you. Um, let, me, let me go to <clears throat> speaking of messages and terminology. Um, one of the que first questions that popped up was, Bart, you used the term escape variant, which sounds uh, ominous and Different. What is the question? Was what is an an escape variant? I think Kay asked that question. Yeah, that's a really good good point. And um, sorry for being so um, uh, obtuse here. Uh, uh, in the lingo, and that's jargon, and I apologize for that. <laughs> the lingo is that we, what we're worried about is a virus that comes up that has escaped the protective immunity that a vaccine is given, and or has escaped the protective immunity that the previous virus from which it evolved. Uh, induces in the setting of infection. So that would mean that the person could be infected again by that virus or the vaccines that we're using would not protect from that uh, infection. So that's what an escape virus is. And that's what we're worried about. And as Matt said, you know, uh, the, um, the companies and Operation Warp Speed are already thinking about uh, if that scenario occurs, what are we gonna do? And to have it ready to go as opposed to waiting until it's obvious that that's happened, et cetera. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but the, the South African variant has, uh, has enough neutralization resistance that it's going in that direction, that this is a, a conversation worth having. As I said before, I think we're gonna be fine with the current vaccines with the UK variant. Gotcha, okay. All right, so going, thank you so much for that, Bart, crystal clear. Let, let's go to like a broader question. That was like the first question I asked. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Barry had this one. So what about the spread of COVID by vaccinated asymptomatic individuals? Do we have any information on that? How should we think about that? All right, I'll, I'll let you go first. That, that's the right question though. So, <laughs> that's what you get. When you got a Duke alumni session, you're gonna get some, right. you're gonna that's get, right. they're gonna get to the point. So Bart, well, well, well quickly, quickly is once you get vaccinated right now, you need to keep your mask on and social distance until this answer this is a great question until this answer is def definitively known. I know that there are studies going on uh, in what's called the HIV vaccine trials network among students at several institutions so that the question can be answered at the end of this semester about <clears throat> whether we know the vaccine prevents active disease, disease that you can tell that their people are sick, but we don't know if it prevents asymptomatic disease. And the unusual thing about this coronavirus that's different from flu and other respiratory viruses is that with this virus, you can be totally asymptomatic and still put out a lot of virus and still infect people. And it's been estimated that up to half of this epidemic spread 
has been due to asymptomatic individuals who um, have virus in their respiratory secretions. So this is an important question to know. I think, Matt, maybe you've got this. I believe that there have been some data beginning to come out that, that, we, that the vaccines do prevent respiratory um, um, asymptomatic spread, but maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, it's, so, so it's, it's the right question. It's a really difficult question um, to answer. Um, I think the, um, the and there, there's actually two parts to it. So one is if you're vaccinated, can you still, if you're exposed, would you have some virus in your nose? You don't have any symptoms, but you still got some virus in your nose. Is that probably still gonna happen? Yes. I don't think vaccines will 100% prevent that from happening. Um, but if, if you have a little bit of virus in your nose, then the real question is, then can you spread that to your family or in a, if you're in basic training or on a Navy ship or you know, in especially those uh, close quarter settings? And that second part is, is that's the really tough one to figure out. Um, on the vaccines that we do have, um, our clinical trials really were designed to show that these vaccines prevent you from having a bad symptomatic infection and ending up in the hospital. And those are what we call our, those were our primary endpoints. We wanted to prove that. And those are the percentages that you see. I think we've been extremely successful at proving that. Um, the numbers for um, what we'll call, you know, infection without symptoms are lower. Um, but there was some data from the Moderna clinical trial that even, even after one dose, you had less people who had virus in their nose 28 days after the one dose compared to others, um, but not zero, but you had less. Um, what you're also gonna see with the Janssen or the J&J vaccine that'll be presented tomorrow is they looked at people who didn't have antibodies against coronavirus when they started the trial, and then had antibodies against coronavirus at the end of the trial. And it looks like if you were vaccinated, you were, uh, you were less likely. You, it, was, it was, if you will, half as much. So I think based on that information, and we're gonna learn a lot more, I think it's fair to say that we're, these vaccines aren't gonna be 100% from keeping virus out of your nose. What we hope though, is, is that even if you have some of that virus in your nose, there's not enough to transmit to other people. So you'll, we will achieve that uh, reduction in transmission. Got you. Great answers, both of you. Both of you. Um, you know, a lot of what you've both been talking about, again, is, is the continued work of tracking and monitoring um, how people who have been vaccinated, um, you know, the, the characteristics that come afterwards. One question that came is just related to this is antibody testing. Um, in fact, it was the very first question uh, that popped up, and it was from Pat, who asked, uh, why are doctors not ordering more antibody testing, um, you know, to ensure immunity in the check on folks? Any, any feedback on that? Well, the, the question, I'll start and then turn it over to Matt again. The question is, uh, we know that a primary type of immune response that protects is called neutralizing antibodies. And so um, uh, testing for that is, is a possibility. Uh, and there's surrogate markers for that. So you can do these tests um, in, in the laboratory uh, without having to deal with live virus. Um, but there are other ways that, that we believe that uh, the immune system protects in addition to neutralizing antibodies. And so uh, we just don't know yet, as Matt says, we're gonna be learning a lot about this in the next year, uh, in the next year and a half, two years. We don't know how much the other part of the immune system, the so-called T cells, and that kill virus infected cells are another way for antibody to act that's not neutralization, but can help us clear virus infected cells. We have evidence that both of these additional mechanisms are good. So I'm not sure it absolutely means, we don't know that it means you're not protected if your antibody is negative. Uh, so right now, um, I, the test is not being used as widely um, uh, as it could be, because we just don't know how useful it might be. And we're very, and there are data that there are other ways to protect other than antibody, Matt? Yeah, and, and the other part of it is that unfortunately, um, after you, even after you have infection, you may not have antibodies for a really long period of time. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you could be antibody positive three months after your infection, and it may be, you may be negative at six months. So 
even an antibody negative doesn't mean you haven't had coronavirus before. And uh, like Bart said, that you could be protected. Even if you're antibody negative, you could be protective because you have that great T cell memory response. We're learning all of these things. Um, what's a super interesting question though that you're raising is, well, what if I had coronavirus before, should I get the vaccine? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the answer is we don't know how good the vaccine is gonna help you, um, but I think it's gonna help a lot, frankly. I think the natural infection kind of educates your immune system, then uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like learning, right? So you, you, get, you get your initial education. That first vaccine dose that you give gives you more education and the next one gives you more education. And, and we think that's the right way to build up kind of a long-term uh, robust protection. So even if you've had coronavirus before, we recommend that you get, um, that you get your vaccines. Um, and what we're gonna do is all of the research over the next year to figure out then how, how protected are you compared to if you never had it before. Um, I think in both scenarios, I think you're gonna have very significant protection. Guys, I have to say, I got, I got another good question coming in from this, but I gotta just say, I wish we could take this and put it on CBS, NBC, CNN, or Fox, because this is just plain talk that I think people would appreciate. I, I certainly appreciate it. Picking up off of that, Matt, what you just said, um, which sort of dovetails into my next question about how people can think about things that may be a little bit scary for them. I mean, I had a really good question pop up from Jason around pre-existing conditions. And the question of people worried a little bit about, all right, so I take this vaccine, I have a pre-existing condition, and I'm worried about adverse effects. So I'm a little nervous about what, what matters more, you know, taking the vaccine and protecting myself from COVID or not taking a vaccine because I'm a little nervous about the pre-existing conditions. And, and the simple question is how does one um, best way to get informed and educated about that? Any insight you, you can have? I think it was a great question. Matt, you wanna go first? I do, great question. Um, the, uh, the, the, the last part is, is that we're learning. Uh, we're trying to figure out these answers in real time. Um, that's our job as a government. That's our job as a CDC and NIH to learn these and communicate that to you, but also to the healthcare provider community. So the, the simple answer is ask your healthcare provider, you know the drill, and if they don't give you an answer you're satisfied with, keep asking and be persistent and, and you know, uh, and learn, get to, get to expert opinion and, and to understand this. Um, I think there's two parts to this question. The first is, uh, what if what if I have a what if I have a situation where my immune system uh, doesn't work normal and it's it's suppressed? Um, in that case, you may not get as strong of a response to the vaccine. Um, but I'm very worried about you if uh, you get exposed to COVID because you may be at more risk for complications. So the answer there is simply uh, you know get the vaccine. Um, the other question, though, is what if you have an immune system that sometimes tends to be hyper responsive, you know, mm -hmm. or the word we use is autoimmune, uh, where sometimes it can get revved up so much and you attack your own cells. Um, we're learning to see if the vaccines are safe in those types of people. Um, what we've seen so far is that uh, the vaccines that we've rolled out, um, you know, again, 65 million plus recipients that uh, that on with the exception of sometimes very rare reactions, um, that these seem to be safe um, and seem to be, if you will, on parallel uh, with like say, let's say your annual influenza vaccination, or um, if, uh, you know, for, as we get older for the Shingrix vaccination, which prevents sick shingles. So we're, we're, we're seeing really, we're seeing good evidence overall on a population level of the safety. This is why we did very large clinical trials of 30,000 volunteers who we follow, oh, we're following for two years and we're following them very closely to look to see if they've had adverse reactions. And the signals are good so far that these are, these are safe vaccines. Um, but your healthcare providers are gonna be your source of information. I would only add to that that when I get those questions, I go to the data. Matt referred to, we have this incredibly uh, open um, a set of data from the companies and it's all online. And I just go and look and someone says, I have disease X. 
And then you can look and see in the placebo, did how many people in, the, in both of these clinical trials, these 65,000 people had that disease and was there any shift in one way or the other? So that's what little data are out there. Um, and then um, um, uh, it's, uh, we're just gonna learn more over the next year as, as time goes on. The trials don't finish for another year and a half or two years. So the, the, the official trials that will lead to approval. So the vaccines haven't been approved yet. They're under uh, EUA, emergency use authorization. And the trials will continue to go on and follow the patients for a full two years as is normal. So we'll, we'll continue to learn. Great. This is the last question, everyone. Um, you know, and I apologize for all these great questions that are sitting there. I'm going to pick one again that has broad applicability and bundle it. Um, and let me just say one plug, you know, to, uh, Matt said tomorrow about Janssen, J&J, which is the same company. It's just, a, you know, as Matt is saying that um, the person who's in charge of that program is actually a Duke parent, uh, Matai Mammon, who's, uh, who I'm sure is, yeah. And you probably, I don't know if you know that, Matt. But Matai, I work well, yeah, I work with Matai all the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's so brilliant, he's brilliant, by the way. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant. He is. His son's a sophomore, um, um, Matthew, same name. So in, in any case, let me bundle this question quickly and say, um, <clears throat> if someone doesn't have a reaction, you know, you see people saying, oh my gosh, I took a shot. I'm so happy that I didn't get a reaction from my two, two shots. But then people start to wonder, wait a minute, I didn't get a reaction. Is it working? You know, so my bundle question there is like, how should one think about if you know you 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 didn't have what seems to be a robust immune response, and then the other question just leave, that has nothing to do with the other one is, and what about young folks thinking about uh, people who are 18 years or younger? What do you guys think about the timing on that? Yeah, well, a couple of points. Um, that's the notion. I don't have any data, but people are studying this as to whether if you have a reaction, you have a better response or not. Intuitively, I, I was disappointed because I didn't have much of a reaction and uh, I wished I had. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm hoping that it doesn't matter. <laughs> but secondly, the whole point about young versus old, uh, the, the data from the trials are showing, and we know that the, the older you get, your immune system is not quite as robust and can't respond to things like influence and what have you. Thus far, it looks like that while there may be a, a slightly decreased response of old versus young, that both are responding quite well. And we're actually just finishing up a study in old versus young primates, monkeys, uh, where we're drilling down into the immune system and looking to see what happens. And frankly, in that study, the older animals are doing just as well as the young animals with regard to being protected uh, and, and maybe even a little better. So. Um, uh, 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 and, and then I'll let Matt answer uh, how uh, immunizing uh, at younger age, age, age periods, because I know we're, we're starting a study here at Duke uh, yeah. in the Vaccine Institute of uh, Immunizing Babies uh, six months of, of age. Uh, Matt? Yeah, great question. So I'll start with the young versus old. So I, I am, uh, I noticed when we started, I'm, I'm P23, which means my daughter's a sophomore at Duke. And so uh, my Duke roots run deep. Uh, my wife, I met my wife at Duke, best part of my Duke, Duke experience, uh, class of 92. So, um, but the point is, uh, we can talk all day, but my daughter's like, well, I, I hate that we, I got to be tested every week. And which, by the way, is a monumental program. And I thank you, Bart, for all that testing, it's keeping my daughter safe. But yeah. she's like, Look, you know, Dad, you can talk all day, but when do I get my vaccine? So, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and the answer is twofold. I think the first is is that um, that population that population isn't at highest risk for. Remember what we're trying. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to keep people out of the hospital. We're trying to save lives. And so, I think the distribution program um, has been rightly targeted for those populations first. Um, I hope that vaccine also dramatically reduces transmission. And so that's what we would be trying to achieve in the younger populations to prevent person-to-person -person transmission uh, and, and protect them for the very rare complication, but it's very rare. Um, so we, uh, again, I, I hope the vaccine, but even if the vaccines only work marginally well for that effect, it's still worth doing. It's just not the, the highest priority right now. I think what you're gonna see though is that um, we've really hit our stride in terms of manufacturing the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And this is public and you're seeing these, the numbers go up. So there is hopefully going to be 
significant amount of vaccines available into the late spring for, for those that are over 18 years old. Um, the second part to the question is, uh, when do we start to get into vaccinating adolescents and pediatric populations? Uh, relevant on many levels, uh, but especially in terms of when, you know, when can kids go back to school? The, an important point is that the clinical trials and the FDA approvals have been for, for Moderna age over 18, for Pfizer age over 16. So what we have to do is we have to show that th these vaccines produce a protective immune response and are safe <coughs> in the younger age groups. The adolescent trials are going on now. Uh, the hope is, is that we would have a good answer on that in the summer. Um, the pediatric trials are gonna take a little longer. And so I think, I think you may see us in a situation in the summer where we have significant doses, um, but we're still working through the indications um, to vaccinate the younger age groups. Gotcha. Well, gentlemen, as much as, I mean, we even got notes asking to extend this session, um, and I know we can't. It's got to bring Sterling on a bit. I want to thank the two of you. This has been a pleasure. I hope we'll get a chance to do it again with more great news. Matt, I'll just say, because uh, I saw you smile about Matai Mammon, when you, you, since your kids are both in the same year at Duke, you know, send him a hello from me as well, because I, I, sure I, I will. Oh, yeah, he's probably hearing the same thing from his son. It's like, come on, dad. <laughs> Get that, right. <laughs> Get that JK vaccine out there. <laughs> Mine is a freshman, so I'm hearing the same thing. There so, Shirley, over to you. Thanks, Carmichael. And thank you to our amazing panelists for today's conversation. Duke is so lucky to be able to call you family and to have your expertise and service working on these critical efforts. <coughs> and thanks to all of you who joined us today. If you enjoyed today's program, which I know you did, Please consider joining us for the next session in our Advancing Health and Wellness course, which will be on March 16th, titled The Bionic Man Advancements in Medical Devices. All of the Forever Learning Institute programs are being recorded, including today's, and will be posted to the Duke Alumni Lifelong Learning YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more with the Forever Learning Institute, visit our website at alumni.duke.edu. Have a, have a great day, be safe, be well, and of course, be forever Duke. Thanks so much, take care.